So maximizing development dollars, uh, understanding post-agile uh, to get the most out of your budget. So post-agile, wait, what? I was talking to Jessica and she says, I haven't even got a chance to be agile yet. And um, I, I kind of think of agile as, um, in fact, I use the same word upstairs, it's like Smurf. It almost means whatever you want it to mean. So I'm using the Smurf process and you can use the Smurf process and we can be Smurfy together. And really agile is the kind of same thing. And so I'm not really going to spend a lot of, there's a lot of things I'm not going to say today. And um, talking more about post agile, uh, I'm only going to spend about five more seconds. The key here is that when we started doing Agile development around the year 2000, um, almost all of the software that was getting written was what? It was uh, payroll systems. It was um, inventory management systems. It was distribution systems. It was logistics. It was all kinds of enterprisey stuff. And, um, and Agile came out of that environment. And today, uh, I would suggest almost such a small fraction of software is that. It may be less than 1% of all software being written today is an inventory management system. Almost all software today is uh, a mobile app or a web app. I would say 99% of all the software being written today is one of those two things. And when Agile came about, uh, it didn't understand that. And this whole um, the usability side of things, having your customers be in the thousands and tens of thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands, that just wasn't really part of the thing. And so uh, what, um, what um, uh, Ample talked about this morning about integrating copy and design and usability, that's not really part of Agile from what we learned with Extreme Programming or Scrum or whatever you want to call it. So anyway, just think that something, there is life beyond Agile. So the other word in my title was talking about budget. And some of you guys um, are from the Brandery, and I, I apologize that you've only got like $20,000. And your whole thing is going to be make or break on 20 grand, and you've got five of it allocated for a developer. All right, great. Some of you guys are maybe a little bit further down the road, and you've got Maybe you're a, a self-made kind of guy and you've been saving up and you think, man, I really want to do this thing and I've got 50000 in the bank and I'm going to build something with $50,000. Okay, great. Some of you guys are, my business is so critical to this software that's going to be built. Um, I have to have this stuff and 100000 quarter million, million dollars. Maybe you want to create the new um, I don't know what kind of app that you're going to make and you're willing to drop a quarter million dollars in it. All right, what we're talking about is budget. And everybody has a number in mind and it's not unlimited. And so as a, the team who's to deliver, we have to understand that it's not, there's not unlimited funds. Whether it's five or 50 or 500, there's not unlimited money there. So what do we do with it? So who am I? Why am I here? Um, I, I actually, it took me, how long? Was it six months? Did it take me six months to come up with this title? Um, here's the scenario. It's summertime, it's hot, and you're going down to Tennessee, and you're going to go whitewater rafting. And everybody loves to do this in the summertime, and you go with your family, and you get that picture, and you're you know, going over the edge, and you're scared, and somebody in the back is bounced up. But what do you do when you go whitewater rafting? Unless you're really serious about whitewater rafting, you hire a guide. And you don't hire a guide to take the boat down the river for you. You don't say, hey, I need this boat from here to there. I'm going to set you the specifications of what time I want it there. And I'm going to describe maybe, um, you know, what I want you to bring with you and I'll meet you down there. Right? When you go whitewater rafting, the whole point is to get in the raft. And so the way that I look at the way we do um, development at Gaslight is I want everybody in the raft. I want our developers in the raft. I want our designers in the raft. I want our copywriters in the raft. I want our customer in the raft. Everybody's in the raft going down the river. And so who do you do? You put the guy in the back of the boat who's been down the river lots of times. And it's, he's, not, he's not in charge of getting you down the river. He's not responsible. He's not the one who is saying, um, Oh yeah, well, I've got, I'm going to call out orders, stroke, stroke, stroke. No, it's just 
the goal of the guide in the raft is to get you down the river with as much excitement and intensity as you can handle safely. And I think of the same way with software. My job is to help you build, a, build something with as much enjoyment and intensity as we can handle safely and get it done. So that's enough about that. I'm not going to have any more advertisements here. So here's the outline for today. We're going to talk a little bit about economics. Originally, when I had this talk in mind, I thought it was all going to be soft and fuzzy. And we were going to talk about things like uh, maybe seeing around a kumbaya as a group. And as it turns out, there's a lot of numbers that I want to talk about. And so uh, that kind of shook out of the outline as we got started. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about economics. This is, can you see that? Yeah. So this is what I usually see. Somebody says, I'm going to do this project and we pay $10,000 a week. And that's what we see week after week after week. So each of these lines that you see is a cumul cumulative uh, expenses that we just keep spending money. And that's why the customer wants to know when we're going to be done, because we're going to stop spending money when we get done. And so here you go. This is what the project timeline looks like. As consultants, this is too much what we see. And I don't know how many of you guys are in the consulting business or contracting or agency or whatever you want to call it. Um, all we hear about is expenses. But there's another side to the picture here. Whoops. I'm going to understand how to do this. There's another side to the picture here, which is there's some amount of revenue that's getting generated, hopefully. That's why we're doing this. So this kind of leads me into another little side track. Um, we have to really understand why we're doing this. Some of you might say, OK, I'm building this thing, and it's not generating revenue. Um, it's really because I'm just trying to save time, or I'm doing it because I think that maybe this might happen or the other. Part of, what, um, part of what I want to be able to do with customers when they come in the door is, in fact, uh, Kristen, when she started work at Gaslight, she actually made a sign of this and put it on the wall that says, software development is really, really hard and you should never really do it. <laughs> That's mostly true. Uh, people who've never done uh, software projects before really don't understand the complexity of it. And Sarah says that this shit is hard and everything is hard, right? I'm not going to argue with her about that, but software is hard too. And if you can get away with taking advantage of Twitter, you should just take advantage of Twitter. You don't need to make your own personal blogging, micro blogging site. You have to say, why are we going to make a personal micro blogging site when Twitter already exists? And somewhere along the line, if it's an internal project or external project, you have you, everything that you say, okay, I'm going to do this, why? Well, because of this. Well, I'm going to, why? Well, because if I am able to export CSVs via email, then my customers will be able to, I don't know why. Ultimately, you ask the question why enough times, and the answer should be, it makes me more money, it saves me money, or uh, it keeps me from losing money. So when I show this picture, that green bar is either the money that it makes you, the money that you don't lose, or the money that you save. There has to be something coming from the project that does one of those three things, or please don't get into the software business. I really, when I was early, and uh, Chris talked about when he was a little hungrier, I took on a lot of projects I probably shouldn't have taken on because I really needed the cash. At the end of the project, we always hated each other, and I wouldn't take their calls anymore. And they wouldn't, they would, it, it, we weren't paying, and it was just like, oh, why did we hate each other? We hate each other because we didn't really understand what we were doing. So here's this, five whys. So this is, allows us to create this line here. And the first time I saw this, it really blew my mind. And it's, I'm sad to say how much that this graph blew my mind. Because usually, like I said, all I see is the red part. The green part's really fascinating. When you add the two together, something magical happens. You can see, can you even see? You can't even see that, man. See if only a designer had taken a look at this. Somewhere around week 11, the project becomes sustaining. What does that mean, sustaining? That means that the revenue that the project is generating equals how much you're paying for each week. This week we generated $10,000 in revenue and we paid this $10,000 in revenue. The project is not profitable, 
but it is sustaining, which means that you can keep doing that for a long time and not have to invest any more money. So at this project, if it's $10,000 a week and it takes 11 weeks to become sustaining, this is a math question, how much capital investment did this project need? Even though you can see these numbers way down here at the end are getting pretty darn close to $300,000, you don't need $300,000. So when the client comes and says how much to build this and you say $300,000 and they have a heart attack, that's not how much money they need. It turns out at $10,000 a week, if it takes 11 weeks, it's only $110,000. So you can get to a point where your projects are sustainable much sooner than how much it costs to do the whole project. So what's the other big piece of this? Well, there is a break even point. It's out there at week, uh, at week 21 that this um, out of week 21 is where the amount of revenue generated completely offsets all of the money put into the project. That's a magical time. There should be champagne being drank then. There should be bells being rung, gongs being hammered. That should be our goal, right? Not, maybe even to make profit, heaven forbid. But just to stop the, the, the bleeding of cash, at this point, everybody should be happy. That's a win. So what can we do to maximize this? When I talk about maximizing your developer dollars, what I'm talking about is how many dollars do you have to put into the project to get the most out of it? So one of the things that we can do, this is subtle. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to go back and forth here, back and forth, back and forth. Can you see what's happening there? Uh, nope, I'm ahead now. There. Right here, you can hardly even see the green until around week five or six. In this one, we start seeing green right, right away. What did we do? How did we start seeing green right away instead of in week five or six? Well, the answer is we chose what features to release carefully so that they were the ones that were the most valuable that generated the most revenue. And the sooner you start generating revenue, the sooner you get to this sustaining point now here in week six and break even in week 11 versus being in week 11 and week 21. So this it seems really basic kind of stuff, and I'm really embarrassed I didn't realize this until really sadly recently, but this is uh, pretty obvious. If you release valuable f features sooner, you can generate more revenue, which causes your project to be sustainable sooner, which allows you to do more fine-tuned experimental features because you're sustainable. This is the opposite. This is actually what we see all the time. Instead of releasing important features early, you say, I've got to have all of this stuff or we can't release. We can't go live until all of these things are done. Well, all you're doing is increasing your, your outlay. Your capital outlay goes significantly higher if you never release. <laughs> that seems obvious, right? but you have to release your software. So here, what, what, are the, what are the conclusions here? One of them is we have to know what features impact our revenue. This is so important. You have to understand of all these features in this RFP that was released, which ones drive revenue and which ones are just there. The ones that drive revenue do those first. The other piece of it that's really important is to ship as early as you can. You can't generate revenue until you ship your software. So between knowing what features are driving revenue and then releasing so you can realize those revenue, that revenue, that's going to help you get the most out of your dollars. The goal isn't, in my book, to be done. Here's all these features. I want to build this site that does this. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to be done. And then I'm going to go away, and you're going to go away, and we're going to all be happy in our separate lives. The goal isn't to be done. The goal is to get sustainable and then profitable. That's what our goal needs to be. And really, when software is done is when it's retired, right? When you're done with the software is when you're no longer working on it. It's no longer growing. You either get busy living or get busy dying, right? So we're going to 
either live with this software or we're going to die with this software, and I'd like to keep living with it. So we want to be done when we can get to the sustainable or profitable point. All right. That's economics. I'm doing great. That's halfway through my time. Um, Velocity's a lie. This is the part where I'm going to say lots of inflammatory things. <laughs> velocity is a lie. What, I, what do I mean by that? What is velocity? Velocity is how fast can you go as a team? Well, what's that based upon? So here's the way the Agile and the part of being post-Agile, this is what Agile says. Agile says that you have a planning meeting and you list out your features and your team sits down and they estimate those features in whatever units you want them to do it. Maybe it's hours, maybe it's days, maybe it's puppies. Literally, uh, Mike Cohn, who is one of the agile, in fact, he's chairman of the board of Scrum and Alliance, has a thing where you, in, you estimate features in dog sizes. This one's, a, this one's a toy poodle, this one's a Great Dane, this one's a Rottweiler, this one's a Chihuahua. <laughs> but this, this piece of, and so you estimate all these things and you say, okay, I've got this many stories that equals 25 points, and I know that I can do 25 points in a week, and so we can get these things done. Five stories, a couple of them are two-pointers, a couple of them are three-pointers, and there's one seven-pointer, and we'll get these things done in the week. It'll be great. We're going to commit to it. And then at the end of the week, what happens? They're not done. Well, that's because of overconfidence. This book, which is really fascinating, I haven't read the whole thing yet. Um, a guy wrote an, a blog post called Coding Fast and Slow, which was kind of applying the concepts of thinking fast and slow to programming, basically says that we can't estimate. We can't estimate. I'm going to say that again. We can't estimate, at least not big things. Well, why is that? The feedback cycle is terrible. I estimate something on Monday, and I'm not going to find out for a week, or, a week or later whether I was right or not, best case scenario. Maybe it's a month later. And there's just, the feedback circle is not tight enough for me to get good at it. There is an exception to that, and we'll get to this in a minute. But basically what I'm saying to you is, anytime we give you an estimate, it is a wild guess. And for me to tell you I can get this box of work done in six months is a lie. And I'm tired of lying to my clients because they don't like it. And I don't like it. And when six months comes and they realize that I've lied to them, they're going to be angry. And so I don't want to do that. I don't want to lie to my clients anymore. And I'm not going to tell them, yeah, we can get that done in six months or not. So if velocity is a lie, what is it that we really want to focus on? Here's the burning questions. I'm Joe Businessman, and I want to know what? I want to know how many features I can ship this week. Is it one? Is it five? And more to the point, if I have this new story here, we've been working for a little while, and I have a new story, how long until it goes into production? Because I'm going to have to make press noise about it. I'm going to do marketing and PR, right? I can't do marketing and PR after it's launched. I want to time it so I have a big launch and it's going to be exciting. And so I need to be able to have some sort of predictability. I completely understand that businesses want some predictability. When is this going to get done? It's going to get done when it gets done, right? We shall sell no wine before it's time. We want to be able to give people some amount of predictability. So th th these are the burning questions. So how many features can we ship this iteration? That's really called throughput. And so the question is, how many features, and, and the difference that I'm proposing to you with metrics between estimation and measuring and predictable velocity versus what I'm proposing is one, we're going to use some math. We're going to have some statistics. We're going to use a historical picture of what's actually happened and taking the subjective piece out of it. I'm not going to tell you what kind of dog that story is. All I'm going to do is going to say, we've got a story done. And I don't care whether it's a big story, it's a little story, whether it's a tiny story, whether, well, I do care if it's a behemoth. But what I'm trying to say is I don't want to get, I want to get out of the estimation business and just do work and then measure. How many stories do we get done and how many days have we worked on the project? So if we have a project that we've been doing for three weeks, that's 21 days, or except those are business days, right? So we'll call it 15 business days. And if we get, uh, let's say that we get 15 stories done, our throughput is one per day. On average, one per day, we get a story done. 
So that's a number that's, that, that you can work with. On average, over the life of this project, we do a story a day. Business people can relate to that. If I tell you, hmm, that's a three, that's a three-pointer, or that's a Great Dane, or whatever, it's, you've been lied to so many times. So many times. And so somebody says, oh yeah, I can get that done in two weeks. And then their manager goes and says, well, he said two weeks, but I know we have to put a fudge factor in there of two times. So we'll call it four weeks. And then his manager says, well, every time he tells me four weeks, he really means six weeks. And so it just keeps escalating. When do you stop adding the fudge factor? Well, let's just avoid that whole thing. And let's go with something measurable. Historically, this is how many stories we get done. One a day. That's throughput. Lead time. Yeah, I am not a designer, and that's why these circles were done with Sketch, and they're not quite all the way filled in, because I had to like use the marker thing on it. <laughs> <clears throat> Those three solid stories represent what's in progress, and this new story is the, is the white one there. Guy comes and says, hey, I got a great idea. Let's do this. OK, when's it going to go to production? Well. We know we can do a story a day. That's what our throughput tells us. And I have three stories that are in progress. And so that's three days to get all of those things through. So at the end of the, of the first day, this, I'm going to use my pointer right here. At the end of the first day, this one finishes, and we start this one. End of the second day, this one finishes. And now this one's moved a little bit further along. Into the third day, this one finishes. And now we've finished out all of what used to be work in progress, and of the fourth day, this guy right here, he's done. That's the way that historically things work out. We finish a story a day, we got three in progress, that means we can't finish this next one until the, until the fourth day. Lead time. Two questions. How much can we get done per day? How long until new features hit the, hit the, hit the production? And that generates this, and this was so exciting. Uh, Chris Moore and I worked on this for quite a while. This, this is, this is, this is going to be a little complicated. I'm sorry if it's scary. Um, it took us a while to understand some statistical terms. I thought this was a histogram. It's actually a census graph. <laughs> Cycle time is what I'm calling how long it takes one story to go from beginning to end. Beginning to end. What is beginning? What is end? Beginning is the time that we say we're ready to work on this. Let's get started. End is when. Is it when the developers think that it works? I've tested this. I've clicked on it. I'm done. Done. Is it when the customer says, yeah, I've clicked on it too. I think it's done too. Done is done to all the way to production, really. You, you, can't, you can't just say, I've gone this far and that's done. Done is done, done, done. And so we have to measure the cycle time is from the time we start into the time we're really done. And what this graph is showing is how many stories actually finished in five days. Well, it's about 10. How many stories finished in one day? 35. Oh my goodness, what in the heck's going on out of here? This story took almost 30 days to finish. Is that because the developers were slow? Well, this graph doesn't show us. But we don't know. The point is, from the time we start until the time we finish, there was all this elapsed time. So what do we know? If this, is, this actual graph is actually from one of our projects that we did. It was a five-week project. We did three weeks, slammed it down. I mean, we worked like mad dogs for three weeks. They went away. They came back. We added another week in. They went away. They come back. They added a fifth week in. Five weeks, this is what the, time, this is what the actual numbers are. How long did it take us to finish a story? Bam, right there. They come to us with this, his, this amount of historical data, and they say, when are you going to finish this story? Well, our throughput says we finish about a story a day. Our lead time says that, well, our lead time on this project was completely screwed up. We took all the projects and we put them in the backlog and said, we're ready to do this work. And then they went away and they spent a bunch of time with their branding agent, and it was 20 days before they came back and we actually started work. So that three weeks of intensive work was after 20 days of waiting. So our lead time on this project was 25 days. But what you can see from this graph is that 
I have a 50% likelihood of completing a story in under six days. That's from the time we start till the time we go to production. And so they can say a 50% chance. I got a 50% chance of getting this story done this week. Hmm, 50% chance. Those may or may not be great odds. What if I can increase my odds to 85% chance? Well, historically, I've got an 85% chance or an 80% chance of finishing the story in three weeks. So if, you abs if you're going to do a marketing buy on advertising this launch, you, can set, you, you better get it set up three weeks because there's a 50% chance it's not going to get done in one week. And that's risk, right? We have to live with risk every day. Business people are good at evaluating risk. How risk tolerant am I as the business owner? Am I willing to drop down money for a media buy knowing that it may not happen this week? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I should make the media buy for three weeks based on what my own risk tolerance is. This graph is fantastic. And you show this to business owners, and I'm not lying to them here. There's no lies here. Well, except, you know, lies, damn lies, and statistics. These are statistics, so maybe they are. But this is historical data that says exactly what we've gotten done in the past. How do I go, Maxwell? All right, so we've talked about project economics. I'm like, 335. I'm doing fine. We talked about project economics. We talked about metrics. We're going to, we have to know in the project economics, we want to know where we get sustainable and where we get break even and go profitable. That's the whole picture of pluses and minus. We talked about metrics and how estimating is a lie and so is velocity, which is based on that. And we want to look at throughput and cycle time and lead time. Let's talk about how we get delays in software projects. This is also the part of the presentation that I call the folks wisdom part. I don't have anything to back all this stuff up. I'm just going to tell you things that I think are true. Here's the, here's the TLDR of the whole thing. If you don't take anything away, and I think that Ample said a lot of this this morning already. Nothing predicts the success of a project better than how often and how well you communicate with your client. We go to the Web Tech Drink Up every month. Uh, one of the local agencies had some guys. They were kind of young. and They didn't have anybody really helping them out. They got a project. Their client came in and said, this is what I want. And bless their hearts, they did great work over a course of three months while their client was in Europe. The client came back. Nothing was the same. Everything that client wanted was almost 100% different. And this guy was at the drink up, drinking his beer and complaining, Urgh, clients, Urgh, they changed their mind. Well, uh, my question is, why did you not talk to him for three months? That, 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 he didn't change his mind at two months and 29 days, right? He changed his mind somewhere along the way, and you should have known that. So how often is too often to talk to your client? And that was his question to me. Well, I don't want to talk to him every day. Well, yeah, you do. <laughs> Maybe twice a day. Uh, it depends on where you are in the project. You might want to talk to him three times a day. Is that crazy? Maybe, but it's just crazy enough to work. <laughs> so how do you, here's the other thing. You got to get your team on board. And when you're starting this project off, the, the source of the delay is this. Developers are a, a cantankerous lot. And they may or may not be excited about working on your project. And if they're not, they'll, you can actually measure how excited they are about their project based on how many pictures of cats show up in their chat room. <laughs> right? If they're not excited about the project, they're going to be browsing Reddit. If they're not excited about the project, they're going to call in well. Well, I'm not coming in today. <laughs> if they're not excited about the project, they're not going to give you their best effort. They're going to be like, I got to get this feature done. And they're going to put it off to the last minute. Meanwhile, they're playing with Node and, and, and Arduinos, you know. The, the, you got to get them on board with the project. And this comes back to, did I put a slide in this? I didn't. This comes back to the why. You've got to sell them on what you're doing and why it's important. When your project matters and they understand that, there's passion there and they're going to get amazing things done in crazy amounts of time. And I've seen it time and time and time again. If you get people who are fired up about something, 
they're going to crank out amazing results. So one of the sources of delays is not enough communication. Another one is that you got to get your team on board and really get them passionate about what you're doing. Um, here is, an, th this is, this is not real. Um, I actually tried to find a project. This is from Pivotal Tracker. How many of you guys use Pivotal Tracker? Stories have states. You have things that are like down at the bottom. They're waiting, the start button's waiting there. They're unstarted and you click the start button and then it turns into that one that's at the bottom that's it's started it's waiting to be finished and then you click the finish button and it turns into an orange deliver button which means hey i think i'm done with this i'm gonna i'm waiting to deliver it and then once it's delivered to the testing environment it's waiting for this accept reject and i love this accept reject because it's making it very clear which what whether this works or not but here's the source of the delay. Can anybody maybe guess what the source of the delay is um, on, on this particular setup? This looks like we've been kicking butt, right? This looks like we're totally rocking it out. We're delivering lots of stuff. Deliver, 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 deliver. What's wrong with this picture? They don't know if they like it. All this stuff is 100% risk. You think you're done with it. Automate sending statements. Finish that six stories ago. That's what this one right there says. Automated sending statements. I think I'm done. Well, guess what? He hasn't looked at it in two weeks. And he comes back and says, that's not done. I meant you need to do it like this. Well, now what do I have to do? I have to unwind. I have to go back and readdress this thing that I had flushed from my brain. I've moved on. I'm talking about super admin client agency filters. I will say that the titles of these stories are actually legit from the client. I went back to an old project to get one that looked like this, that has a bunch of stuff waiting there. All this stuff being accept, waiting for review is all 100% at risk. I don't know how many times, well, actually, I probably do. You work on stuff and the client, they're busy. They don't, you don't talk to them every day. You don't talk to them twice a day. You don't talk to them every other day. They're busy. They've got a trade show. They're going out. They're trying to sell stuff. They're doing their own business, and they don't have time to talk to you for a couple weeks. Everything you get done during that couple of weeks is at risk because you don't know whether it's right or not, and you've moved on. And I promise you, somewhere in here, this is like playing Minesweeper. <laughs> somewhere in here, you're going to click this, and it's going to blow up. And then what happens? Delay. But if we had addressed it the day that it happened, then it wouldn't be we wouldn't have that delay. We could, you, th here's the thing. Because we can't estimate and we can't really predict how software works, the only thing that we have, the only truth that we have is exactly what is the current state of the system right now. That's all we have. You have to, as the business owner, you need to know exactly what is done and what is not done. You need to know exactly what's in progress. You need to know exactly what's coming up next. And if you don't know those things, then you can't make good decisions because there's, you, don't, you don't have the ability to predict into the future. You only know right now. And this right here is masking what is happening right now. You don't know what your current state is. All right, so plan ahead, but not too far ahead. Uh, the, the, whole, the big design up front, BDOF, big, des big design up front, BDUF. I, um, you know, back in the old days, we called this waterfall, right? You would have, and when I was in college, you'd have the design phase, and you'd have the implementation phase, and you'd have the testing phase, and then you'd have the release phase. And the design phase, you'd have to create all, and this was before I actually had designers. So when I say the design phase, we were drawing like block diagrams, functional diagrams of how the software would hang together, and that would have to get approved. And you would design the whole system out on paper in block diagrams or UML diagrams or data flow diagrams or whatever these things are, and you would design how it was all going to work, and that had to get approved before you could start writing code. Well, the problem with that is, and I say this all the time, when we start the project, we're never more stupid than we are at that day. Every day, 
best case scenario, we get smarter because we know more about the project. Every week that we deliver functionality, we understand the problem domain better. Every day that we deliver working code, we understand how the system actually works, not how we think it works. You know, the old joke is the difference between theory and practice is that in theory there is none. In practice, there actually is. The way that you design something is good in theory, but it's not until you actually build it that you know how it actually hangs together. So we don't really want to make any decisions at the beginning when we're at our dumbest. We want to make decisions when we're smart. We want to put decisions off as long as we can until, they're, until we're smart enough to answer them. So plan ahead. The Ample guys talked about their process this morning. I thought that was really fantastic stuff. Um, what we want to be able to do is we want to design not the wireframes for like the whole site, which is I think what they were having problems with as well. Here's a 42 page document of wireframes. That's unwieldy, right? We want to generate wireframes for each individual feature as we build it. So how does the uh, admin accepting of user applications work? Well, here's the wireframes for it. Here's the workflow for just this one feature. And we can work through that with the client. Does this work the way you want it to work? Well, meanwhile, the developers are doing something else. When that one little feature has been designed, it goes over, over the wall. It goes to the next stage where the developers now have that one feature ready to go. They're ready to start work on it. Meanwhile, Design starts working on wireframes and usability for the next feature. So you're designing and doing usability for one feature at a time just before development gets to it. What that means is as you get things built and working, you can figure out how the next piece of it meshes with that. Now you have to have a, the whole picture in mind and we do that as, as well and I'm not, that's part of the process that I'm not going to have time to get into because I'm 45 in minutes into it. So plan ahead, but not too much. So success or failure, success or failure. Success or failure really comes down to your relationship with the client. It's, it's everything comes down to that. How many times did you have a software project fail or a client get angry with you or demand a refund for work because you couldn't figure out how to get the code to execute the right thing at the right time? That's never happened. We're smart guys. We can make things work. Technology almost is never the problem. The problem with software projects almost always comes down to your relationships. It comes down to bad expectations. They come down to bad communication of what the current state is. They come down to not really understanding the why of what we're building, not really understanding the intent of what we're building, not getting the right timeline of getting it done in the right time window. None of those things are technology problems. They're all communication and people problems. So I, feel, I mean, I'm, I, I, I hate the whole, uh, back in my day, we used to, I'm not gonna tell you how long I've been in the software business because I don't wanna get into those, those discussions. What I am gonna tell you is I feel like that in my career, the amount of energy that I spend on learning new technologies or learning a better craft of how to be a developer or learning better testing strategies, I feel like that those days are kind of winding to a close. What I'm spending all of my energy on is trying to learn how to talk to people better, how to write better, how to understand the emotional content of conversations better, how to communicate in a way that helps build trust. All of those relational things are really what is going to make or break the project. And so, um, I don't know who it was, somebody here tweeted yesterday after Sarah was speaking about Oh, well, I guess I got into IT because I didn't want to have to worry with writing. I guess I'm going to have to brush off those grammar skills. Like, yeah. The days of being the super nerdy IT guy and being the prima donna kind of guy or gal or the, you know, stuttering socially and awkward, that's just not good enough anymore. It used to be fine. It's not fine anymore. We got to really get our people skills up another level. All right. So. Here's what, the, uh, here's what the summary of this is. Man, right on time. Understand how your features tie to revenue. I'm not going to read this stuff. What I'm going to you can read this stuff as well as I can. 
Here's what I'm trying to say to you. We can do better when we really become a team. My favorite words right now are whole team. We have to act as a whole team. It's not the design team and the development team and then those pesky clients. All of these people are on the same team. We have to work together as a team. And that has to be done across the board. You know, we used to be able to say as, you know, Gaslight started as a bunch of nerds in the room coding stuff up. And our clients would come and say, hey, we have our own designers. Will you implement these mocks? Sure. Sometimes they would say, hey, we need this functionality. We'd build it and then we'd go sub out a, a designer to come put lipstick on the pig. That's just not good enough anymore, right? We have to be a team working together. And it used to be enough that you could have the client hand it over and some agency would take it on and work on it and they would be wowed with it, but that's not good enough anymore either. Every day the expectations are raised and today the expectations are that you and your client and all of the disciplines of your team have to be on the same boat going down the river together. All right. I think that's all I have. It is. That's the last slide. So, um, I, don't, I don't know if we have any time for questions yeah. or not. My problem with Pivotal is that Pivotal is, it is the perfect manifestation of agile development process. And in the old, when I was using Bugzilla, and we saw Pivotal, and we're trying to get our customers to use Bugzilla, what were they thinking? <laughs> Pivotal was perfect. It was so optimized for what we were doing. You start work, you finish work, you deliver work, and they accept or reject it. Today, if you saw the diagram that the Ample guys did of, like it used to be this nice pipeline, and now it's like this, right? It's true, there's so much stories go back and forth and back and forth, and sometimes these people are working on these stories, and sometimes these people are working on these stories. And that handoff of a feature, because stories are features, that handoff of this feature's being designed from a u user experience perspective, to being implemented by a developer, to being designed with a UI perspective, all of these pieces, that's, that's not a single pipeline and Pivotal just can't handle it. And it makes me really sad, but I think, I want to go Kanban so bad, you just don't even know, but all of the Kanban boards really stink and I'm sad about that and I don't wanna to have to build a Kanban board, but we may have to. Um, can you talk about how you determine which uh, features are the valuable ones? Mm. This is the opposite of the can you estimate how long it would take to build this feature. So I used to be really facetious um, when I was a jerk, which is like yesterday. <laughs> and they would say... He's not kidding. <laughs> they would say, how long does it take to implement this feature? I says, I don't know, how valuable is it? <laughs> you know, it's like answer an unanswerable question with an unanswerable question. Um, I think, I want to say that it really comes down to understanding the why. When you understand how each feature drives the bottom line, either it protects revenue, increases revenue, or saves costs, then you can have a better, maybe it's even a gut feeling, but as you understand how those things relate together, you can figure out, it, it's, it should be more intuitive. That's the best I can say. Chris? I just had a thought when you're talking about value. The other thing that I might add to that list of things you added is, is lowering risk to something really terrible happening, because there's definitely sometimes when That's managing costs, features, right? Yeah. It's, so it may not be actual cost, it may be lowering the risk of a certain kind of cost. Yeah, but you have to tie everything back to some kind of revenue number. You can't just say, I want to export CSV reports via email because, because. Can you give an example of how you got your team pumped up on a horrible job? <laughs> <laughs> um, we do things that are terrible. Uh, and I keep harping on emailing CSV reports. We've been doing a lot of CSV exports lately, and it, it just oh, it just it just kills me. It, it just make I die inside every time we export something by CSV. 
My question on this exporting a CSV is why do you need this as a CSV? Why are you going to take this data and put it into Excel? What are you going to do with it in Excel? Once we understand what you're going to do with this data in Excel, hey, maybe we could just do it, right? If you want to see some fancy analytics, let's do some fancy analytics. Let's not put it in Excel. And then you're, pat, you know, you're emailing these things. Well, anyway, <laughs> that is, um, it's hard. And you kind of have to keep pushing. And every day that we talk to the client, why are we doing this again? What is this that we're really doing? And finally, the one client says, listen, we just got to have it. Just stop asking me. OK, I guess that's what we're going to do. And guess what? Those features took longer to finish because we weren't excited about them. But once we get to, we, you know, we're trying to partner with our clients to understand what they're trying to accomplish. What story are they telling? What's their, what's their why? What's their drive? What are they trying to do? And as the guide in the project, I don't want to build up the backlog with a bunch of things like exporting data in CSVs, I really want to understand what the big objectives are. What are we trying to accomplish here? What are the big picture items? We may have a dozen stories that are related to one big objective of analytics. And so I want to constantly be pushing on the client to say, how does this get us closer to our goal of having better analytics? Right? You have to have those larger pictures and keep pushing towards that, because we know that analytics helps uh, save costs to help customers. It's, it's innovative for the customers that they can do these kinds of analytics. Whatever the story is, you have to have that bigger picture in mind and don't get so caught up with, well, it's another week's worth of work. We got our backlog full, you know. We want to really understand what the objectives are. So as a developer, I, I got to say what makes me pumped up about a story, what makes me excited and passionate about a story is the client selling me why this is awesome. How does it help you? Like, tell me why this is going to allow you to make so much money, why this is going to save you so much time, and then that gets me excited. Anything else? i also add on to that. Um, I think as... As developers, uh, and as uh, all the disciplines, the one thing I think we have in common is creating something. And as building custom software, I mean, the thing that excites me is really, what are we doing that's new? Are we creating something new? Because if we're not, well, it already exists, and you should just use it. <laughs> but if I can get down to what's actually new about what we're doing here that doesn't already exist. A lot of times that's pretty exciting and interesting and that can apply to a lot of different uh, facets. All right, I think we're about I out think of we're time. Done. Thank you, Doug.